Now, with all of my spectacles, we move to the second one, which goes like this. Would you agree that a mind is the subjective experience of being, appreciable only by that mind, and that the mind cannot subjectively experience being any other mind beside itself, except by its attempts at empathy, the accuracy of which is not verifiable, and the experience of which remains within the original subjective experience of being? In other words, whatever a mind is, we can only experience or know our own. With behavioral observations and empathy, we can assume similarity, but is there any evidence? Um, I can only say I agree with uh, what the questioner is uh, perhaps slightly um, uh, uh, disconcertedly saying, uh, which is in essence, we are all of us uh, um, uh, captured within um, ensconced within the envelope of our own awareness of our own minds and that we can't ever escape that envelope. We can't ever enter really um, the envelope of anybody else's subjectivity. In a sense, uh, that is the meaning of subjectivity. It's got to do with the state of the subject, not of the object, not of anything beyond um, myself. And I think that it is absolutely fundamental to understand that that is the bedrock of the mind. Now, the questioner goes on to say, we can, uh, in a kind of um, roundabout way, come to know the minds of others in an indirect way through what we call empathy. That is a sort of uh, secondhand um, uh, mirroring of the state, uh, uh, but it is a mirroring in the sense of a reconstructing uh, within ourselves some model of the state of the other. Um, and he also says, or she also says, that from observing the behaviors of others, we can infer something of their mental states. But there's no verifiability, there's no proof. These are very important philosophical points. They're very important sort of basic facts about how the mind works. But they also are important scientific points uh, in the sense that um, it, it, they define the limits of what psychological science can do because to the extent that you're doing science on the mind, you're doing science on something subjective, you're doing science on something that can't be externally verified um, and you're in big trouble. Uh, and this is uh, why the history of psychology has been littered by all of these embarrassing attempts to try to avoid the essential nature of what the mind really is. Behaviorism being the extreme example where the mind was ruled out of court and there was no psyche in psychology. The mind is subjective. There's no escaping it. We've got to, you know, start from there. But the crucial um, additional um, feature of the mind, if you will, I don't know if you can call it a feature of the mind, but certainly something very interesting about the mind is that it can also be observed objectively, not as a mind, but as a bodily organ. That the brain is the objective, anatomical, external realization of the mind, which is the subjective, psychological being of the brain, if you will. So if these two things are two different ways of observing what is ultimately the same part of nature, which all the evidence suggests uh, they are, that the brain is the organ of the mind, the brain is the external manifestation of the mind, then we can use this objective um, realization, this objective equivalent of the subjective state, this objective external manifestation, um, this physiological anatomical thing. We can study that and correlate what we observe objectively with the subjective reports. And on this basis, we can, we can escape the solipsistic, um, sub, uh, 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 in, in radical subjectivity of the mind by making correlations between subjective states and objective data, always in, an, in, a, in a recursive fashion, going from what, what is reported to the objective data, back to what's reported, uh, back to, this, uh, to the objective data, if you proceed in that way, in the end, um, you can do science on the mind in the same way as you can do science on anything else. In other words, you end up with a reasonable 
uh, hypothesis based on all the available evidence. And from that hypothesis, you can make predictions. And you can say, because I believe the mind works like this, uh, I, I, I predict that if I were to do that, this will be the outcome. That's based on my, on my theory. And if that is not the outcome, my theory is wrong. On that basis, we can do ordinary science um, of the mind. I know I'm being very abstract. I, I, I'm sorry, it will become clearer as the course proceeds. So let me just try to say the same thing in a slightly simpler and more succinct way. Yes, the question is right. The mind is radically subjective. You can only ever know your own. And you can't ever have direct proof about the states of minds of other creatures. However, because the mind is also something that can be observed and studied by and investigated via its bodily organ, the brain, we do have a foothold, uh, an objective foothold, by which we can do science as long as we remember we're not reducing or eliminating the subjective experience of the mind, rather correlating it with another way of looking at the same thing, and in this way we can move forwards. And we can know, um, with all reasonable scientific objectivity, we can know things about other minds and the mind in general. We can infer laws about that part of nature known as the mind. And that's, uh, in, in, in essence, what this course is hoping to demonstrate.